we'll be continuing through Matthew's Gospel, section 6 of Matthew's Gospel, which, as I've outlined it, that covers from the end of chapter 20 of Matthew all the way through to the very end of chapter 25, which, if you've noticed, is where we are. So we are drawing very, very close to the end of chapter, of section 6, rather, by coming to the end of chapter 25. But of course, all these events are describing Jesus' final visit to Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Uh, so this is you know, his last chance to say the things he needs to say you know, before he goes through with uh, redeeming the world uh, through his death and his resurrection. And the common theme for much of what he does there in Jerusalem is judgment. So I've very much titled this section, Jesus Pronounces Judgment Against Israel and Its Leaders. Now, uh, for a very long time now, even within section 6, where we've been for a very long time, I've been focusing on these last two chapters, 24 and 25, because those make up sort of their own portion that's pretty important. It's the Olivet Discourse, as we've called it. This is a private sermon from Jesus to his disciples. And in this portion, Jesus predicts and describes the destruction of Jerusalem's temple, his second coming, and the end of the age which does play into this theme of judgment that's here throughout section 6, although he very much broadens it you know, beyond things just there in Israel you know, to really the rest of history and his eventual return. Now, we've made it uh, here to the last half of the Olivet Discourse where Matthew gives us these parables from Jesus, all of which are exhorting us to watch for his return. So the application section is pretty clear in this. It's all about making yourself ready deliberately for Jesus' return. That's the great goal of the Christian, to be ready for his return. Well, we're discussing today the final parable of these parables in the last passage of chapter 25, and that is the parable of the sheep and the goats, which I will read to you now. This is Matthew 25, starting in verse 31 through 46, very lengthy one. So here's what Jesus says, his conclusion to the Olivet Discourse. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and invite you in, or naked, and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Really I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger? or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Then these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now I call this passage a parable simply because of the starting image of separating people like sheep and goats. That is where it begins. That is, you know, broadly speaking, a comparison, which is very much how most parables are. 
Uh, but for the most part, the parable is simply a description of the final judgment of the nations. Overall, it's pretty literal in terms of the, what he's trying to get across here. Uh, now, I have called my sermon today, you know, based on the opening image that he gives of the shepherd separating the sheep and the goats. So I've called my sermon today, Greener Pastures for God's People, you know, trying to keep with the very shepherd imagery that he has going on here. But in this parable, we learn that Christ at the final judgment will deliver his people from persecution and neglect, which is an angle on this passage that probably does not really get covered very often whenever we talk about the sheep and goats parable or the final judgment. But I become more and more convinced that that actually is the purpose of such passages as these, that God will deliver his people from persecution and neglect through the final judgment. Now, my outline today has five headings as I try to lay that out before you and explain to you why I think that is such a big deal in this passage and perhaps other passages on the final judgment. So first, Jesus will judge the nations in fulfillment of prophecies. So I want to connect this back to some other things we've seen from the Old Testament and just show you the, the broader context of ideas for this parable Jesus tells. Secondly, Jesus will judge people like a shepherd judges a flock. I want to lean into the shepherd analogy and go to a particular passage that I think informs what Jesus is doing here, his source, if you will. Third, Jesus will judge people according to how they treated Christians in particular. A, perhaps a slightly more common theme here talking about the, the sheep and the goats judgment, but still I think overall neglected that people's treatment of Christians is particularly in view here in the final judgment. Fourth, Jesus will judge people according to their works. And this is kind of like addressing the elephant in the room about the way this final judgment is conducted and how that jives with the gospel, as we would tell it. And then fifth, Jesus will judge people worthy of eternal punishment or eternal life, which is just the conclusion, but there are several things to say about that at the very end, and it's the great so what of the passage. So I want to make sure it gets some space in what we do today. Now today's passage shows us how Christ himself views the final judgment over which he will someday preside, as he is going to be the one managing the final judgment. And this is you know, one of the few passages we have where he himself talks about his role in that and the things he will say and do. After all we've seen in the Olivet Discourse, it's fitting that Christ should end with the very end, the final judgment. I mean, we've been talking about how so much of what he says here gives you a blueprint for what history is going to be like. And here is history's end at the very end. So all of that makes sense. However, the problem is usually with us and our attitude or our, our very limited vision toward this final judgment. We tend to view this final judgment as mere, merely a formality, if you want to use that expression. The necessary end of this age and the beginning of the next. It's just something that has to happen before we move into the eternal state there, you know, after all these things are concluded. In, in contrast to that, though, Christ views the final judgment as a part of his role as our shepherd. Because he says that, like, he's going to do this like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And usually we think of Jesus as a shepherd, you know, this very pastoral image, literally pastoral, because that's what the word pastor means. It's a shepherd. You know, we think of Jesus caring for us in some way as our shepherd. And that's the leading image of the parable. And so this whole idea of the final judgment, you know, kind of comes into that, his role as a shepherd, our shepherd which is not, again, usually how we think of it. We usually think on very different lines. We think about merely ideas of justice and, you know, God just kind of rendering justice, you know, on people that have been sinning against him. Nonetheless, I think the true way to deal with this passage and other passages is to recognize that shepherd-like idea here in the final judgment and how that plays into everything else. So Jesus is going to fulfill, you know, these promises that we see in scripture of God delivering his people. Interestingly enough, there are shepherd passages like that, 
Probably the most famous passage of scripture in the entire world is Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not want. Well, you know, what is in there? It's all about leading God's people to, you know, green pastures and still waters and protecting them with the rod and the staff and all those kinds of things. Well, the final judgment, I think, is the ultimate form of that, of God shepherding his people, Jesus in particular stepping into that role as the shepherd. So what we have here is this ultimate fulfillment, delivering his people once and for all time through this final judgment, delivering them from all who harm them or those who just don't care about them, honestly. So that is where I'm going with all of this. And if it still seems a little bit removed from this whole idea of the final judgment, I hope you will see more clearly what I mean by that as we go through all these things. So let's begin with kind of the, the bare bones idea of the final judgment, going back to Old Testament scriptures that inform this idea. So Jesus is going to judge the nations in fulfillment of prophecies, so things that God has already promised. Now, although Jesus adds the idea, perhaps, of the uh, Messiah being absent from the world for a while, only to return later, uh, the idea of a final judgment has always been there in the Old Testament somewhere and recurring throughout it. So there's a lot that Jesus throws in here that is maybe new to people, new to the disciples, especially the fact that he's going to go away and then come back. But the final judgment, you know, that is old news in a sense. Of all the Old Testament passages we could read about the final judgment of the nations, I've chosen two and uh, one of them here to start off with is Joel chapter 3. And I want to read this. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's the entire third chapter of Joel. So if you want to go there and follow along, feel free to do so. And it might be a bit overkill, but I want to read this uh, because I think it gives a lot of detail that is very important specifically for today's passage and today's sermon. So as I read this, I would like you to have your minds engaged, so I'm going to give you something to do as we read this together. I would like you to watch for the purpose of the final judgment on the nations, because there are statements in here in Joel chapter 3 about why God is doing this. And I believe you will see that the purpose of the final judgment is to deliver God's people from the nations. So let's read this, Joel chapter 3, starting in verse 1, all the way through to the end of the book of Joel. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, as they have divided up my land. They have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Moreover, what are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you rendering me a recompense? But if you do recompense me, swiftly and speedily I will return your recompense upon your head. Since you have taken my silver and my gold, brought my precious treasures to your temples, and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, in order to remove them far from their territory. Behold, I am going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense upon your head. Also I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the sons of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare a war. Rouse the mighty man. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm a mighty man. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near, 
in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. And in that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and all the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. Egypt will become a waste, and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah, in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Now from that passage, we learn several details about the final judgment. You know, specifically, we learn that the purpose of the judgment is to deliver God's people from the nations. So often in that chapter, he comes back to this idea of, I'm doing this because of what you did to my people, and I'm doing this to deliver my people from you. And so much of what he says there is all about that, delivering his people from the nations. Now, I'd like you to remember that as we move forward in the sermon, because it's not the last time we're going to see that. It's very much a theme when we talk about the judgment of the nations. Now, I have another passage for you. And although this qualifies as a passage about the judgment of the nations, I'm including it really for another reason, because Jesus refers to this passage somewhat directly here in Matthew 25. I want to read a passage from Daniel chapter 7, which is where I'm going next. won't read as much of that one, but I do want to read it, because Jesus actually takes the famous vision of the Son of Man from Daniel 7 and merges it very naturally, I think, with the final judgment of the nations. There is stuff about judgment you know, in this passage, but the focus is really on the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, so I do think they go together. I think it's very natural. But I want us, want us to look at this and see what Jesus does with this as he talks about the coming of the Son of Man. So again, this is Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 14. So here we are, Daniel 7, starting in verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. This is from earlier in the passage where Daniel sees the vision of this horn that represents some evil world ruler, or national ruler at least. So I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed, and given to the burning fire. And as for the rest of the beasts, which represent other nations Daniel's been talking about, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now I believe you will see the similarities between that vision and today's parable. You know, the Son of Man coming, heavenly beings, a kingdom, thrones, etc. All those details find their way into Matthew 25 as Jesus describes the final judgment and the sheep and the goats and all that. It's even really dealing with nations because these beasts that he's talking about all represent nations of the world that you know, eventually fall under the judgment of God when he comes to set up his kingdom. 
Right? So all this ties in pretty well with what we see in Matthew 25. But I would also like you to see a difference. Maybe this difference is uh, important enough to mention here. In Daniel 7, you'll notice that the Son of Man goes up to God to receive his kingdom. Right? That's how it's worded. It says, one like a Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days. So it's very much about going up to God. Uh, perhaps that is the ascension of Christ. If you want to read this in light of what we know from later things, it makes sense to view that as Jesus returning to his Father. But in Matthew 25, you'll notice the Son of Man comes down to judge the nations. Because that's how he words it. You know, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious thrones and the nations will be gathered before him. So it's all about coming to the nations, which is, you know, from heaven being above, we're coming down now, so it's kind of a downward motion, which is very common in passages that refer to Daniel 7 in the New Testament. So it's kind of an opposite thing. Rather than going to God, it's coming down to the nations. Kind of an interesting reversal there. So even though Jesus borrows language from Daniel 7, the final judgment represents what might be the following action, right? In Daniel 7, we see him, the Son of Man, go up to God to receive his kingdom, and then come back down to execute that judgment that has been discussed in Daniel 7 and other places, which I think is very fair. You know, I don't think it's, strictly speaking, an alteration of the idea. I think it's just the following action. When the Son of Man goes up to the Ancient of Days to receive his kingdom, what else is he going to do but come back down and enforce that decision and render judgment on the nations and set up his kingdom in place of these wicked nations that have been destroying the earth all this time? It makes sense. So just want to point that out as a difference, but uh, even though it is a difference, I think it is a reasonable one. Now all that to say, when we look here at this parable of the sheep and the goats, whether it's from Joel 3 or Daniel 7 or any other passage from the Old Testament we might use, Jesus is drawing on stuff. Like he's very much fulfilling previous prophecies. There's nothing here that is strictly speaking new in terms of the actual plan of God. It's just him following through with stuff that has been promised already. Now my next observation probably gets us more into the actual purpose of the day. All that stuff I said about uh, the purpose of the final judgment being to deliver God's people. Uh, we saw some of that in Joel for sure, but we're going to see it again. And we're going to see it in this image of Jesus acting like a shepherd over a flock. You know, he's going to come He's going to separate the sheep and the goats like a shepherd would. So he's going to judge the nations of the world like a shepherd might judge a flock of animals. So again, just to read the passage here in Matthew 25, let's read verses 32 and 33, just to get the very beginning of this. It says, uh, actually, let's back up to 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. So very shepherd-like image there. Now to help you better understand why Christ is using the image of a shepherd, I would like to read the source passage for this image. And I do think Jesus has a source. I think he's getting it from somewhere. So let's turn to Ezekiel 34. And I have a, another long bit of scripture that I want to read for you and to help you find that if you want to actually go there. It goes Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Uh, so if you can find any of those books and you know, triangulate in there if you want to get to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, and I'm going to start reading in verse 17. And again, I'm just going to read all the way to the very end of the chapter. And again, just... Pay attention to some of the language here, you know, the, the basic imagery being used, but also the motivations of why these things are happening. Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 17. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Is it too slight a thing for you that you should feed in the good pasture? that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pastures, or that you should drink of the clear waters, that you must foul the rest with your feet. As for my flock, 
they must eat what you tread down with your feet and drink what you foul with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with the side and with the shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns until you have scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will deliver my flock, and they will no longer be a prey, and I will judge between one sheep and another. And I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season. They will be showers of blessing. Also the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure on their land. They will know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bars of their yoke and have delivered them from the hand of those who enslave them. And they will no longer be a prey to the nations, and the beasts of the earth will not devour them, but they will live securely, and no one will make them afraid. I will establish for them a renowned planting place, and they will not again be victims of famine in the land, and they will not endure the insults of the nations any more. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. Now I've called Ezekiel 34 the source for the parable of the sheep and the goats because of the numerous similarities. I'm sure you saw them easily as we were reading it together. Both passages feature judgment, using that word, judgment. Both passages feature a division between sheep and goats, although to be fair, Ezekiel does have many more animals. He's got like a whole barn of animals in there that he refers to. Jesus keeps it simple, sheep and goats, but multiple kinds of animals in both passages. Both passages refer to the nations as the subject of this judgment, so that's in there too. Finally, both passages feature the Messiah. Now in Ezekiel, I think the Messiah makes his appearance under the name David, right? So God promises to make David the new shepherd for Israel. And I think we just automatically understand, and I think this is right to understand it this way, we assume that David is actually a reference to the Messiah, who is the son of David, the branch of David, and the future David. You know, he's the king that fulfills everything that David was supposed to be. So I think it's very natural to take that as being messianic, referring to the Messiah, so Jesus. And as for Jesus himself, you know, in the parable he tells, he's the one doing this. It's the son of man. It's the king. The Messiah is doing the separating between the sheep and the goats. With all these similarities between Ezekiel 34 and Matthew 25, I think it's fair to say that this is his source passage for this parable of the sheep and the goats, this passage from Ezekiel. So that's why I've identified it as such, and I want to lean heavily on this. To push this further, knowing the source passage adds to our understanding of the parable's message. When we go back to see what Jesus was thinking, we can take some of those ideas and bring them in to this parable of the sheep and the goats. In Ezekiel 34, the whole reason for the separation of the animals and the judgment is to protect some of the animals from the others. You got these weak sheep getting bullied around by all these fat horned goats and things, and it just like, it's this ugly scene and they're trampling down food and fouling up waters and doing all this stuff. And the shepherd comes in and says, enough. We can't do this anymore. The whole point of all this is to protect some animals from other animals, like a shepherd would naturally do if he saw a bunch of his animals attacking uh, some of the other animals. The prophecy is therefore a picture of God's protection of his people from the wicked people of the nations. It's a lot like Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 made the point continually that he's going to do this judgment of the nations to protect his people from the nations. Here, it's very much the same idea. He's going to come in and render judgment in defense of 
the animals that are his. Therefore, when we read about Christ separating the sheep from the goats, we need to imagine what was happening before that separation. What was happening before the Son of Man came down to render judgment? Well, half those animals were attacking the other half. That's what was happening before the shepherd came down and said, enough, we're going to deal with this right here, right now. You've got to remember that. You've got to bring that in as we think about the parable of the sheep and the goats. The final judgment of the nations is not merely about satisfying justice, but about protecting believers from the wicked people of the nations. This is a huge aspect of, what, of why God has this whole final judgment thing planned. It's not just balancing the scales. It's protecting the sheep. That's also a part of it. Now, with that in mind, I think it's very, maybe not fitting, maybe very full of meaning that Matthew is actually the only one who records this particular parable. Because when you compare the other versions of the Olivet Discourse from Mark and Luke, neither of them mention this whole judgment of the sheep and the goats. Just Matthew brings this in. Now, Matthew, of course, as I've argued many times, he seems to have a very Jewish audience in mind, specifically an audience right there in the land of Israel. Uh, he seems to be very much interested in evangelizing them and discipling them. Now, the Jews, the nation of the Jews altogether, very much considered themselves God's people. In a lot of the passages we have read, God's people is specifically said to be Israel or Judah or Jerusalem. So, to some degree, they have a right to think of themselves as being God's people and under God's protection. But things have changed a little bit because Jesus has come, and a lot of the Jews didn't fall in line with what Jesus was saying. And in fact, they were very much there in the crowd chanting for his crucifixion and all of that. The presence of this parable in Matthew is kind of meant to prompt, I think, people to think, now, what side of the line are you actually on? Are you one of the sheep or are you one of the goats? I know you are Israel, but are you really Israel? Are you actually God's people? Are you following the Messiah? You know, do you actually belong to the shepherd? It's very interesting that Matthew's the only one who included this, and I think it's his way of kind of prompting any Jewish readers to think on this and consider carefully whether they're going to be on the right-hand side or the left-hand side when the Son of Man comes to do the separating. But as for people who are already Christians, uh, they could and we can, you know, this is for us as well, we can take comfort in knowing that someday Jesus will come in and judge his flock like a shepherd. We're not always going to have to be like fighting off these goats and everything and drinking fouled up water and all of that, to use the imagery from Ezekiel. There is going to be a day when these things are dealt with, and we can take comfort in knowing that, that this day is planned. The whole final judgment is actually for us. It's not just to satisfy the justice in God's heart, it's to take care of his people. That day is coming, and Jesus will handle these things zealously on the day that he returns. Well, for my third heading today, I want to argue more for what I've already said, but I want to take a different approach with it. I want to argue that Jesus will judge people according to how they treated Christians, how they treated believers, the people of God. And I think, you know, we've, we've sort of smuggled that into the passage from these past passages, but I want to show you that it actually is in the sheep and the goats judgment that we read here in Matthew 25. So let's read a little bit more of this, Matthew 25, starting in verse 34, and let's read through verse 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Now these verses and the verses which follow are very often quoted to talk about caring for the needy in general. 
they're very often applied in ways that are very just indiscriminate, like any needy person, anyone who's hungry, anyone who's thirsty, anyone who's sick, anyone in prison, very general. The problem is Christ is not describing care for the needy in general, but for needy Christians. It is specific, and I, th I think he makes that nearly as plain as he could make it by his wording here. Now, if you have any doubt about what I say, consider that Jesus calls these needy people his brothers, right? Verse 40, you know, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. These brothers of mine. Now, Christ has previously made it very clear who is and who is not his brothers, who is in his family. And I just want to jump back a little bit in Matthew and read a passage on this. This is Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. Very familiar, somewhat infamous incident. But Matthew 12, verse 46 through 50, we see this. While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. In other words, interrupting the sermon. <clears throat> Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, if you want scriptures about caring for the needy in general, and any and all needy people, regardless, you can easily turn to hundreds of scriptures. It is a major biblical theme. We have talked about that before in the past in this church. But today's scripture is about caring for needy Christians, the brothers of Jesus. And if the reference in Matthew 12 is not enough for you, keep in mind the logic that Jesus uses there in the parable, the sheep and the goats. The whole idea is that, you know, in so much as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You know, there's a connection there. With whom does Jesus have a connection? You know, with whom, you know, who is it on this earth that you can variously help or hurt and would make Jesus say, you did that to me? Well, that would be his people. We see this Plainly as ever, and when Jesus confronts Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, one of these other classic passages that for some reason we forget about. But Acts 9, verses 4 through 5, this is when you know Jesus has already appeared to Saul and given him the fright of his life, basically, putting the fear of God in him, putting the fear of Jesus in him more accurately. Uh, Acts 9, verses 4 through 5, And he, that Saul, fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, well, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, Jesus was in heaven. He was fine. Like, he wasn't, you know, being thrown in prison by Saul or anything like that. But Saul was persecuting Christians. He was hauling them off to jail. He was voting to put them to death. I mean, so, but as Jesus reckons it, you're doing that to me. You hurt my people. You hurt me. And it's the same logic over here in Matthew 25. Jesus views himself as having that kind of connection with his people, that to do something to one of them, you do it to him. Same reasoning, and it very much establishes what I'm talking about, that we're talking about how people treat Christians in this passage. It's not just any and all needy people. It's Christians in particular. Now, I'll also say this. These uh, needy Christians here that are hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and in prison and all that, I think they're suffering some persecution. So they're not just needy, you know, they have been very much, you know, on, been, on, been attacked by the world. That's why they're needy. Let's put it that way. They're needy for a particular reason, because the world has shoved them aside and mistreated them. Now, I've already argued from Joel 3 and Ezekiel 34 that the final judgment is God's act of protection for his people against their persecutors. We've seen that from both of those Old Testament passages, but I've not yet argued it for it from today's passage. Well, the details here, I think, you know, give us some hint that that is what is going on. If nothing else, visiting Christians in prison, which he does mention in this passage, 
I was in prison and you visited me. That certainly refers to the persecution of Christians. Not many Christians are going to find themselves in jail for any other reason than that they're Christians. Because kind of the whole idea of the Christian life, you're not supposed to go out there and be a criminal. But for being a Christian, you might very well get thrown in prison. And that does happen even to this day. So that's probably why the people here in Matthew 25 are in prison. They're being persecuted. Now, as for the rest of it, the Christians who are hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and wandering in places foreign to them as strangers, all of that should sound a little bit familiar to you from some other things we know about life as a Christian from that time and really, to be fair, other times and places, even to the modern day. But I want to read you a comparison just briefly from something Paul wrote. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. He's, this is his, his uh, long rap sheet of things he's, he's He's boasting as a fool at this point, trying to give his credentials as an apostle. But here's one of the things he says about himself. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. It's like it sounds like he's hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and all that kind of stuff. The same kind of thing that we see over there in Matthew 25. It's not just a general neediness. I mean, persecution will do that to Christians. Persecution has done that to Christians. Persecution does do that to Christians. You know, we're fortunate to escape a lot of that here and now where we are, but it's still part of the Christian life, broadly speaking. It can be a very rough life depending on when and where you live. The point is, when Christ returns to judge the nations, they will be judged according to how they treated Christians. In other words, they're finally going to pay for persecuting believers. So that is, you know, very much kind of outward directed. You know, we're very much talking about how Jesus is going to deal with those people. But it does kind of throw into uh, another light here, something else that we talk about as Christians, and that is loving the brethren. You know, we've got this idea that among Christians we should be loving each other, we should be taking care of each other. What if you don't? Uh, what if you're actually not doing the kinds of things Jesus describes that we ought to be doing, you know, clothing those who are naked and visiting those who are sick and feeding them and all that? What if you don't do that? Well, then you fall under the same condemnation as the nations do, right? Isn't that the idea? You know, this whole idea of loving the brethren is not just a nice idea. You know, it's not just our, our gimmick, our sales pitch for why people should join a church or anything like that. It's actually something you're supposed to be doing because, again, in so much as you do it to the least of them, you do it for Jesus. 1 John uh, 3.17 uh, gives another perspective on this just briefly. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And, of course, it's a rhetorical question. This is one of John's many tests, one of his many indications for how to tell the difference between true believers and genuine believers. Do they love the brethren? Are they, you know, clothing the naked? Are they feeding the hungry among believers? Are they doing that? That's how you show you have the love of God in you, according to John. And by the way, it's worth mentioning here that not caring for Christians is the same as hurting them. The way Jesus reckons it in the parable of the sheep and the goats, those are the same thing. And that applies to, you know, the nations of the world, you know, being mean to us, but also, for any of you that claim to be a Christian but aren't caring for other Christians, you've got to realize not caring for Christians is the same thing as hurting them. Let's read the rest of the passage here. Matthew 25, verse 41 through 46. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Now, the, fun, the, the thing about that is, 
these people that he's describing here, they don't do any active harm. You know, it's not like they're tying Christians down and beating them or something like that. They're just not helping them. They're just not giving them food, not giving them clothing. They're just kind of standing idly by. You know, you might say these are the people in a society that don't do the act of persecuting, but they're just kind of standing by and not helping and not raising their voices to stop it. Well, according to Jesus, they fall under this condemnation too. Like this is, this is how zealous Jesus is for his people. He, like he's not just angry at those that hurt his people. He's angry at those that don't help them either. And that is the standard of the final judgment. It is the way he's going to judge people. They are going to, he is going to judge people according to how they treated Christians. That is his way of shepherding his flock there at the very end of the age. Well, now it's time for the elephant in the room, as I said. Halfway through the sermon, it's time to address this great observation from this passage that Jesus plans to judge people according to their works. Like unapologetically, like he doesn't even hold back. It's like far from holding back, he's, he's like being detailed. He's giving specific things you did or did not do. These are deeds. The judgment is according to works. Now passages like today's parable, and there are many of them in the Bible, in fact, any passage you see giving any kind of detail about the final judgment is kind of like this, in that it totally focuses on deeds, on works. And it makes a lot of Christians really uncomfortable. Like a lot of Christians, they just don't like to deal with these passages. Because the core teachings of Christianity are that Jesus died to atone for our sins, and that faith in Christ is what God requires for salvation from sin. You know, he's very much the sacrificial lamb. He's not just the shepherd, he's the lamb. He gives his life to take the sins of the world upon him and suffer the wrath of God for them and so win forgiveness for people. It's kind of the chief idea of Christianity. We develop these core teachings into doctrines like substitutionary atonement and justification by faith alone and phrases like free grace, and they matter a lot to us. We find them very helpful for categorizing and understanding what salvation is. It's very important. And then we come to the sheep and the goats, and we see that the final judgment is conducted entirely according to works. And we go to other passages and see the same thing. Uh, this can be a bit bewildering. This can be confusing, since the Bible also teaches that salvation cannot be based on works. This is another clear teaching of Scripture. So we've got two very clear teachings of Scripture that are just kind of at odds with each other. So what do we say about all this? You know, how do, we, how do we process this information? What do we do? Well, in giving my answer to these objections and these problems, I want to emphasize that my answer applies to the entire Bible and not merely today's passage, uh, not merely the conflict between the final judgment and salvation and all that stuff. This is kind of a total Bible thing. So hopefully this will be helpful to you uh, thinking about other conflicts as well that we might see other tensions in scripture and the basic idea is this that every truth has its proper time right everything that is true you know comes into a certain part of your life and has a purpose there and not necessarily in other places every truth has its proper time now in, in saying that to you and recommending that to you I just want to point out that humans are creatures of extremes if you've not noticed that, if you, in other words, if you don't read the news or anything like that, people are creatures of extremes in that we really cannot do anything over here without neglecting something else over here. We can't have these convictions over here without totally neglecting these ideas over here. We're very extreme. We tend to be all on one thing and totally neglecting something else. We're extremes. We can't have any strength without a corresponding weakness. We can't have any great insight without creating a blind spot somewhere else. We can't have a conviction of our own without disparaging somebody else's conviction. It's just kind of the thing we do. We're very extreme people. Now, God knows that. God knows that we're creatures of extremes. And for that reason, I think God's word tries to hit us from as many different directions as possible to give us some measure of balance. I think, that's main, I think that explains a lot of how the Bible is written. I think maybe if you stand back and think about the Bible, you might ask yourself, why isn't it written in a more like uh, organized, 
kind of specific way where everything is just kind of spelled out very clearly? Why is it all like a bunch of letters and books jumbled together? Why is that? Well, I think it provides a measure of balance. Reading the Bible can be like a game of ping pong, except you're not one of the players, you're the ball. Uh, you're actually there in the middle of it all. You read some scripture, it resonates with you. You, know, you really see the, the need for this in your life, you really see the importance of it, and you commit yourself to it, and you immediately go overboard with it somehow. It's just because, again, we're creatures of extremes. We take that and we run with it, and we run too far with it. And then, as you keep reading your Bible, you read some other passage of Scripture, some other idea that comes in and knocks you from the other direction and now gets you going the other way. And it just keeps happening over and over again. Ping pong, ping pong, back and forth. And what that does is it keeps you generally in the middle. You might be flying all over the place on the table, but you're still on the table. And that's the important thing, right? You're still kind of generally centered in all the things God has for you. I think that explains a lot of how the Bible is written. And so, the atonement of Christ, or justification by faith alone, or free grace, or any of these other ideas, these wonderful truths of the gospel about salvation, these are wonderful truths for people who suffer terribly under guilt and question whether God could ever love us, and whether God is willing to have anything to do with us, and whether it's even possible for us to be saved. Well, that's what the gospel is for. You know, that's supposed to come into your life and knock you in the right direction and get you repenting and believing in the gospel. And then when you go too far with that and become very, very sloppy in your obedience to God and aren't giving proper heed to the things that you ought to be doing, here comes this other paddle from the other side to hit you in the other direction. And that paddle is called the final judgment. The judgment according to works is like, well, if you want to you know, get that eternal life being mentioned, you've got to care for your fellow believers, right? You've got to do all these things that Jesus lists. That serves a purpose. It keeps you from going too far on the free grace side. So again, it's kind of weird, yes, but given the fact that people are creatures of extremes, it's actually really helpful to go from one passage reading about Jesus dying for our sins and then going to another passage about the judgment according to works. It keeps us centered and grounded so we don't get too far away from anything that we need to be believing and need to be doing. So, with that in mind, I urge you to give your attention to today's parable. You know, it is here in the Bible for a reason. It's the paddle that God's going to use to keep you from going too far, that too far off the table. You got to listen to these things. Don't ignore it just because it doesn't sound like the gospel or whatever. Just give it your attention. Really commit yourself to this. You could easily ignore today's parable and say, oh, well, I believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, for the glory of God alone. And you can list off all the Latin phrases that we use from the time of the Reformation to summarize those ideas. But the same man who died to purchase your salvation also said he was going to judge people according to works. And he gave us a lot of detail on that in this very passage. And it's coming from the same person. It's coming from the same person the one you call Lord, the one you call your shepherd. So be sure that your zeal for 50% of God's word does not lead you to condemnation by the other 50% of God's word. Again, this is for your good. It keeps you on the table. It keeps you from leaving the boundary lines of the game. Ping pong, ping pong. It's, it's very helpful if you let yourself get slapped around like that. Just let, your, let the Bible do its work and don't ignore a passage just because it makes you uncomfortable. Instead, Give heed to it, live by it, accept it. That's my advice for dealing with this sheep and goats judgment, and it's, uh, it's judgment according to works. Okay, my final heading for today, I want to comment on the very end of the parable, the last thing Jesus says, the last words of the Olivet Discourse, where we see that Jesus will judge people worthy of eternal punishment or eternal life. It's how he ends, verse 46. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So in a whole section of Matthew's gospel dedicated to Jesus pronouncing judgment against Israel and its leaders, this statement is the capstone. You know, we have gone full judgment, like all the way, you know, like eternal judgment in this last bit of uh, this last statement in the Olivet Discourse. Before the Olivet Discourse, Jesus came into Jerusalem with stern words 
and final warnings and a list of woes and just kind of cranked up the intensity a little bit you know, each day as he's there in Jerusalem. Eventually, he draws away with his disciples for a private sermon, the Olivet Discourse, which we've been studying for a very long time. And although Christ has described much in the Olivet Discourse, he finishes this sermon and this whole section with the only event which really matters, right? Whether you receive eternal punishment or eternal life. Isn't that true? Like, this is the thing. Like, you get, like, the day of the Lord is one day, and you only get one chance to get to that one day and get the right verdict. Like, this is all that actually matters. Everything else leads into this, and afterward, everything is governed by this. This is the thing that matters. And make no mistake, eternity is forever. And believe me, I know there are people that come to this verse and try to wiggle out of that and say that eternal punishment is somehow not really eternal punishment. And they do this. Sometimes Christians have tried to soften the condemnation in this passage by observing that the Bible sometimes uses the word eternal to mean a long time, but not necessarily forever. And it does that. Language does that. It's like, oh, I've been waiting here forever. It's like, well, not really, but I'm trying to emphasize that. And they say, well, like, we, we speak that way, so maybe that's what verse 46 is. Maybe the eternal punishment isn't really eternal. Maybe it's just exaggeration. And they hope to avoid the conclusion that hell is forever. Well, that's a nice theory, but what about the very next statement? These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Is that eternity forever? I mean, do you hope that eternal life is forever? Isn't that the idea? Isn't that our great hope? Like, well, eternal life seems to be eternal, right? So don't back up to the previous statement and say, oh, that means something different. It's the same word in the same sentence. You don't just change meanings of words halfway through a sentence. That's not, that is not how language works. Yeah, we can use hyperbole and exaggeration and all that, but we don't change the meaning of a word in the middle of a sentence unless we're trying to give some sort of clever pun or something like that. That's not how this works. He's telling you what eternity is going to be like in as much of a direct way as he possibly can. You get eternal punishment or you get eternal life, but either of them is eternal, and you can't just wiggle out of that. So this matters. I mean, this is the day you've got to be ready for. Now, to, there's something else he says here that I think really comes in to make you think about the gravity of this. And it's really, the only word I can think of for it is dehumanizing. And I think, it's, I think it's deliberately that. The final judgment for those who are going to get the eternal punishment part of it is very much dehumanizing. Did you notice that hell was not prepared for humans? Did you catch that? Back up to verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. But not humans. Like, it wasn't prepared for them, but that's where these people are going. It's strange to think of it, knowing what we know, but hell was never designed for humans. That wasn't the idea. Like, it was totally meant to be the prison of the angels that sinned. You know, Satan and all those that cast their lot in with him. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Humans go to hell now thanks to sin, but that was never meant for us. The place that God built for us was the Garden of Eden. And then we left the Garden of Eden and the rest is history. But originally, hell was not intended for us, even though that's where so many of us are going to go. Now, we speak of various events uh, or various states of living as dehumanizing. And sometimes we can speak as something that robs you of your humanity. That's what dehumanize means, to take away your humanity, to take away the thing that makes you human. In our more dramatic moments, we use that to describe certain jobs we don't like. And believe me, I've had some dehumanizing jobs. But really, when you really want to lean into that, the dehumanizing things are things like abuse and torture and slavery and things like that that just really strip away everything about you that makes you a person. Those kinds of experiences are dehumanizing. We say that because humans who experience those things are made to feel, perhaps be, 
less human than they were before. And that's not just poetry. Because if you meet someone that has gone through those very agonizing events or, state, or states of life, they're not all there in terms of what they can do with their minds and their hearts. You know, they are very much permanently damaged by that in ways that, you know, maybe permanent is too strong of a word, but it sure can feel that way when dealing with such people. I mean, that is dehumanizing. Something about them that God designed to be in them has been taken out of them. And figuring out how to get it back, if that's even possible, is really difficult. That is, that's what we mean by dehumanizing. Now, hell is the ultimate form of dehumanization because it was not meant for humans. Think about it. It was meant to imprison demons. Like, think about that. I mean, that's like, set, that's like taking a guy who, like, stole a paperclip from his office and throwing him in a maximum security prison. It wasn't meant for him. Like, that's not right to do that kind of thing. You know, there are different kinds of criminals in this, and we imprison them in different ways. Well, cosmically speaking, hell was not made for a human. To throw a human in there is like, oh, that's like, that's, it almost seems like overkill, except that we're dealing with the wrath of an offended God. And people that, you know, before God robs these people of their humanity, they robbed him of his glory. And that's what makes the difference. It actually makes you, I guess, back up even further, sin makes you less like a human and more like a demon. Therefore, you go to a place for demons, if you want to think of it that way. But the point is, I mean, this hell that has been invented here, it was never originally meant for us, and it is absolutely awful to think of anyone going there. Now, I tell you this for the same reason that Jesus tells us this. Go for the eternal life. Goodness, like, take a hard turn away from that side of things and go for the eternal life. We have seen recently in some of these other parables from the Olivet Discourse that Jesus really doesn't require you to do much. You know, there are aspects of the Christian life that can be really hard, especially when the real persecution, you know, kicks in. But in reality, like, it's just about being ready for his return. It's about caring for your brother or sister in Christ. I mean, it's just like, it's basically an adjustment of your attitude and to make sure that there are certain things that you do regularly. That's basically it. When you get right down to it, it sounds a lot easier than going to a place designed for demons. It sounds like infinitely easier to do that. Reading verse 34 again. The king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I mean, that, that sounds so much better, and the way to get there is fundamentally not that hard just based on the things that Jesus has said to us here at the end of the Olivet Discourse. Serve Christ. Be ready for his return. Show love to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Believe the gospel. Repent of your sin. Like, these things are so much easier and so much more appealing than hell. Like, fundamentally, it's not that difficult, but it's the thing that so many people will not do. So be sure that you, you fall on the right side of the line on that day. Be with the sheep instead of the goats in that day of final judgment. So that is what it means for Jesus to be a shepherd, which is a lot, uh, a lot more than we normally think. Usually the idea of Jesus as a shepherd is kind of a warm, fuzzy thought, probably because we have all these paintings of like Jesus cradling lambs in his arms and all that. But I mean, shepherds had to do a lot. I mean, David as a shepherd was like killing lions and bears. I mean, like the image of a shepherd, this is a tough guy, okay? Like, yeah, he cares for the sheep, but he's also going to go wrestle down these lions and stuff. And that's part of it. And that's part of it. That is the purpose of the final judgment. Yes, there is this time when like, God has appointed us to go through this time of hardships and the difficulties of life. And there's a purpose for all of that. You know, there is a reason for our suffering. It builds up for us an eternal weight of glory beyond measure. But there is a day where Jesus is going to come in and call all of that off and deal with the people that have wronged us or not helped us. He is going to deliver us from these difficulties. 
And today's parable is about that. That's what I've been trying to get across to you as I've been talking about this, that in the final judgment, Jesus will deliver his people from persecution and neglect. And I went through this in various ways. I connected it to some Old Testament prophecies like Joel 3 and Daniel 7 and showed you how Jesus is acting to fulfill these things. Then I took you to the source passage, as I understood it, Ezekiel 34, where we get the idea of the final judgment being like a shepherd separating his flock. And then thirdly, I talked about how Jesus is going to judge people according to how they treated Christians. That is from those passages, but it's also here in Matthew 25. And then we dealt with the, the observation that naturally comes from that, that the judgment is according to works, but that's okay because it keeps us from going too far in the grace direction that we lose track of who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do in this world. And then finally, we talked about Jesus judging people worthy of eternal punishment or eternal life and just tried to exhort you in the very same way that Jesus does to swerve away from the eternal punishment. You know, believe the gospel, serve Christ, be ready for his return, help your fellow brothers and sisters, and be a sheep. You know, don't be a goat, be a sheep. Now, on that note, everyone here has to either encourage themselves with thoughts of those greener pastures that we've been talking about, or perhaps you need to make sure that you're actually heading for those green pastures. This is a chance to examine yourself. You know, examine your thoughts, examine your attitude, examine your life. You know, whether that's, you know, for some of you, you might still be at the gospel. Like you need to actually believe in Christ for salvation. For those of you that have done that or believe you have done that, you know, you need to think about this passage from that perspective. Are you acting like a sheep? Are you acting like a goat? Are you caring for God's people? Are you doing something to that aim? Like these are the things you need to be thinking about. This is the application for these things. You know, be sure you're living out the things that Jesus wants you to be living out as we think about this passage. All right, well, that's all I have to say about this. Uh, next time, what I plan to do is I plan to do a full summary review of all of section six, which amazing me, ama amazingly, I have to like reach back several years to do that, which is just insane to me, but I will be doing that. We'll gather up everything from section six and be ready to close down this section of Matthew.